A Stroll Around Holy Isle, 1992-2022 to Off the southwest coast of Scotland lies a beautiful little island. Just two miles long, but with a majestic presence, the Holy Isle rises up untouched and solitary from the water surrounding it. The island has been associated with Celtic Christianity for almost 1,500 years and became known as Holy Isle at the end of the 18th century. It is now a registered UK sacred site with free public access. Over the last 30 years, Churje Lame Yeshe Lozal Rinpoche, abbot of Kagjul Samueling Monastery in Dumfriesshire, has taken custodianship of the island as chairman of the Rokpa Trust. Under Rinpoche's guidance, buildings at the north and south of the island have been carefully restored, historic landmarks have been preserved, high standards of environmental stewardship have been introduced, and a centre for world peace and health has been established, bringing together people of all faiths and none. Holy Isle is open to everyone, and to protect this sacred space, Rinpoche requests everybody to follow his five golden rules while they are on the island. To respect life and refrain from killing, to respect other people's property and refrain from stealing, to speak the truth and refrain from lying, to encourage health and refrain from intoxicants, and to respect others and refrain from sexual activity that harms others. In May 2007, His Holiness, the 17th Jalwa Karmapa, head of the Karma Kaju lineage of Tibetan Buddhism, wrote a foreword for the Holy Island booklet. His Holiness comments on how Holy Isle demonstrates alternative ways of interacting with others and with the environment, bringing possibilities for change, hope for the future, and furthering the cause of world peace. This slideshow will cover the history of Holy Isle, how Lama Yeshe Rinpoche became involved, and then take you on a clockwise tour of the island, as is customary in Tibetan culture, beginning at the south and stopping at the various landmarks to describe their history and development over the last 30 years. Holy Isle's History Holy Isle's first recorded name was Inish Shrine, which means the Island of the Water Spirit. This was changed to Eileen Malasha, and later El Malasha, named after the Celtic Christian Saint Malasha of Leilin, who lived on the island as a hermit at the end of the 6th century. The original settlement on Arran was named Loch and Island, the Loch of the Island, and this is now known as Corden and is located approximately one kilometre south of Lamlash Pier. Over the passage of time, the names of the two areas were conflated and became known as Limalas, Lambath, and finally Lamlash, with Holy Island being known as Lamblash Island until the early 19th century. The vibrant movement of Celtic Christianity started in Ireland and spread through the islands and the west coast of Scotland in the 6th century. The Irish abbot and missionary St Columba pioneered this tradition in Britain, crossing the sea from Ireland in a coracle to found a monastery on Iona, located 120 kilometres north of Holy Isle. St Aidan, one of Iona's monks, founded the great monastery of Lindisfarne, the other holy island, 200 kilometres east on the Northumberland coast. From Lindisfarne, Christianity spread throughout much of England, and its learning, art and spirituality inspired many others across Europe during the following centuries. St Malasha was very much part of this tradition. Born in Ireland in 566 AD and named Lashrin, He was the son of the King of Ulster and the Scottish Princess of Argyll and Butte. Miracles accompanied St Malasha from the very beginning of his life. The barren midwife, who held him as a baby, became fertile after he made the sign of a cross. 
and a blind man's sight returned to him when he washed his face in Malasha's bathing water. He was much loved by his people, and after the death of his father was offered the throne of Ulster when he came of age. Instead, at the age of 20, he chose a life of religion and seclusion. Just as the Druids had a profound appreciation of nature, the Celtic Church had a tradition of going directly to nature to feel the presence of God. And there was a strong belief that a person must understand creation to understand the Creator. It's likely that Holy Island was already considered a special holy place when St Malasha chose the cave as his hermitage in the year 587 AD. To travel, he relied on a simple craft, capable of dealing with the Irish Sea, and from which he could fish to supplement his diet. When he reached Holy Isle, there was an ample supply of fresh water, but the island was rather scant of other resources for growing food. A decade later, in the year 597, he left the island and travelled to Rome, where the Pope ordained him as a priest. After returning to Ireland, he became the abbot of Leilin Monastery, where he is credited with advocating the Roman method of dating the celebration of Easter. He later returned to Rome in his late 50s and was consecrated as the first bishop of Leilin by Pope Honorius I. 600 years later, the Vikings called Holy Isle the Melansi. In 1263, Viking king Hakon of Norway brought a fleet of ships to the shelter of Lamlash Bay before fighting the Scots at the Battle of Largs. Vigleker, one of his marshals, went ashore at Holy Isle and cut runes with his name on the wall of St Malash's cave. There is some evidence of a small wooden monastery built on Holy Isle in the early 14th century, approximately where the Centre for World Peace and Health currently stands. It's alleged to have been endowed by Lord John of the Isles, who was probably Angus Og MacDonald. Angus was an ally of Robert the Bruce, who left Arran in February 1307 to restart his struggle for the Scottish throne during the First War of Scottish Independence. In 1488, Holy Island's custodian was John Hunter, a forester who took care of Lord Hamilton's woodland hunting grounds in Arran and Cumbrae. In 1527, John Hunter's descendant, Robert Hunter, passed Holy Island over to the Earl of Arran. The island continued to be part of the Arran estate in Hamilton ownership for over 400 years. In 1547, Dean Donald Munro is recorded as describing the 14th century monastery as a bit run down, it now being over 200 years old, although there are references to the ruins of a Gothic chapel as late as 1768. After it was abandoned, funeral services were conducted there until the end of the 18th century. These services ceased when a burial party's vessel was capsized by a squall resulting in the loss of many lives. Lamblash Island was renamed the Holy Island around this time. In 1779, Captain James Hamilton obtained a long lease on Holy Island and built what he called the Big House, the old farmhouse now called the Harmony Wing. In his later years, he used the island as a yachting base. In the mid-19th century, the island was used for smuggling whiskey. The name Smuggler's Cave, given to a well-hidden cave between the centre and Malasha's Cave, is a reminder of that time. The story goes that around the 1850s, a couple spent their honeymoon on the island. The man was blindfolded and taken to a secret place where he was given as much whiskey as he could drink, and he was promised all the whiskey present if he could find the place again the next day. But despite thorough searching, he never found it. The smuggler's cave seems to have been used for other, possibly ecclesiastical purposes as well. Several crosses have been cut into the wall. By the late 19th century, the birth of tourism brought holiday makers on paddle steamers down the Firth of Clyde from Glasgow and the growing cities and towns of Scotland's central belt. Holy Island regularly rented out holiday accommodation. In 1871, Oxford professor Charles Dodgson 
better known by his pen name Lewis Carroll, visited the Hermit's Cave and had a picnic on Holy Island. During both the World Wars, Lamlash Bay was used as a naval base. The bay is deep enough for submarines, so during the Second World War there were booms placed at both ends of the bay with huge nets to keep out enemy submarines. The Royal Navy practiced shooting heavy machine guns on the east side of Holy Island and the holes in the red sandstone can still be seen from the sea. Modern submarines, warships and helicopters are regularly sighted on training exercises in the area. In the early 20th century, the Kelzo family lived in the farmhouse. They had animals and grew crops which allowed them to be self-sufficient. Flags were used for communication with Lamlash and the steamer would sound three hoots on the whistle to announce any unexpected visitors for the island. In 1957, the Duchess of Montrose, daughter of the Duke of Hamilton, died and the death duties were so high that the Arran estate had to be divided after over 400 years of Hamilton ownership. Part of the land was passed to the Forestry Commission and the National Trust, while other parts went into private hands. In 1958, Stuart Huston of Pennsylvania, USA, purchased Holy Island. He was a millionaire and a descendant of the Minister of Kilbride at Lamlash. But despite his interest in the island and its history, he rarely visited, and the land continued to be used for grazing sheep by local shepherds from Arran. In 1968, the University's Federation for Animal Welfare was asked to advise on the husbandry and management of the island's animals, so they leased the island and set up a field study centre. In 1971, after Stuart Huston passed away, they were able to buy the island to continue their studies. By August 1982, UFAW could no longer afford to keep the island, so it was put on the market. Twenty months later, in April 1984, the island was bought by James and Catherine Morris for £120,000. They moved into the farmhouse the following summer with their two sons, aged 14 and 7. They managed to connect electricity from the lighthouse complex at the south end to the farmhouse at the north, a distance of almost three kilometres, which made living in the farmhouse much more comfortable for them. The following years proved to be a financial struggle, and when Mr Morris's health started to decline, the island was put on the market in 1987 for £1 million. By 1990, the island was still on the market, and some concerns were raised about the welfare of the animals, so all the highland cattle and the seven ponies were taken off the island, leaving the Sarnan goats, the soy sheep and five Eriske ponies. Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's dream and custodianship. In the early 1980s, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche was on a solitary retreat in the USA. During his spiritual practice, Rinpoche dreamt that he flew over an island surrounded by lights, like Tibetan butter lamp offerings, a place that he felt would nurture understanding and trust between people of different faiths and beliefs where all forms of life could live in harmony. Almost a decade later, in the autumn of 1990, Rinpoche was approached by Mrs K. Morris, a devout Catholic who owned Holy Island together with her husband. Mrs Morris had a dream where she'd been instructed by Mother Mary to pass Holy Island to him, to be used for peace and meditation. On the 22nd of December 1990, the day of the winter solstice, Rinpoche made his first visit to Holy Island, accompanied by a few students and Mrs. Morris's son. Rinpoche was excited to see Holy Island and felt an instant affinity for the island's rugged terrain, recognising its sacredness, having been sanctified by centuries of prayer and devotion. As darkness was falling, Rinpoche insisted they spend the night. The old farmhouse at the north end was completely derelict, 
and had been vacant for several years since Mrs Morris had left to look after her ailing husband. Despite no heating nor electricity, Rinpoche's party managed to spend that first night in an old room which is now the library. While the others slept, Rinpoche meditated and prayed. He saw the twinkling lights across the water on the shores of Lamlash, which vividly reminded him of the island he had seen during his vision almost a decade before. Rinpoche was determined to take custodianship of the island, to reawaken its sacred past and develop it as a place of retreat where peace would be easy to find, not only for Buddhists, but for people of all faiths. The asking price was £750,000, with millions more required for renovations. Despite being offered more from other parties, Mrs Morris agreed to accept Rinpoche's offer of £350,000 because of her firm belief that Holy Island should be passed to him. Despite not having any money for this project and being told he was totally crazy, Rinpoche had an unwavering commitment to raise the funds. Akon Rinpoche, the co-founder of Samuel Ling Monastery in Scotland, was going to mortgage Samuel Ling so Holy Island could be purchased. However, a successful international fundraising effort started in the autumn of 1991 resulted in generous donations from thousands of people and the island was signed over to the Rockper Trust on the 18th of April 1992. Aims of the Holy Island Project Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's vision was for Holy Island to become a living spiritual centre, dedicated to peace of mind in a peaceful world. Rinpoche's intention was to bring great benefit and inspiration to people everywhere through the combination of pure minds within a pure environment. To achieve this, there were three main aims, which were echoed by His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he visited Sami Ling in 1993. First, that all development work is undertaken in harmony with nature, to conserve the island's pure environment and to serve as an example to others for the future. Second, to provide the most conducive conditions and resources for inner development through the traditional practice of long-term retreat. And third, to foster world peace through the founding of an international interfaith centre for peace, retreat and reconciliation. His Holiness the 17th Karmapa's forward offered endorsement and encouragement for the island and its activities, noting how the values and aims of the project correspond with his own personal vision of how the world could be, a place of safety, peace and harmony for all sentient beings, clearly demonstrating alternative ways of interacting with others and with the environment, bringing possibilities for change, hope for the future and furthering the cause of world peace. His Holiness also notes that Tibetan Buddhist culture is represented in many different forms on Holy Island, but because the island is dedicated to nurturing spirituality and exploring the deeper meaning of life, its facilities are open to people of all faiths or none. The Journey to Holy Isle To reach Holy Isle, one would first take a ferry from Ardrossan Harbour to Brodick on the Isle of Arran, sailing across the Firth of Clyde. The journey is about 14 miles and takes about an hour. Holy Island can be seen as the ferry approaches Arran. Regular ferry crossings have been operating, weather permitting, since 1829, historically run by railway companies and by Caledonian McBrain, known as Calmac since 1973. On the east side of the island of Arran is the village of Lamlash, where a local boat, the Holy Island Ferry, takes small groups of visitors, volunteers and supplies over to Holy Isle. The ferry lands at the north end of the island, where visitors are greeted by one of the small team of volunteers. 
The crossing is about one mile and takes 10 minutes, with the water reaching depths of over 30 metres. The local ferry typically runs daily, April to October, but only twice a week during the winter. There have been several Holy Island ferries since the 1990s. Sally, Sierra and Ichthus. Owned or co-owned by three captains. Other organisations have also provided chartered crossings. There are other ways of reaching Holy Island, such as swimming, rowing, canoeing, chartering a private boat from Ardrossan directly to Holy Island, or even a helicopter flight. Naval submarines are sometimes seen to the south of the island, but have not been known to drop off any visitors to date. In the 1970s, the wardens used wooden boats, which were eventually abandoned on the shore. The weather on Holy Island is similar to that in other areas on the west coast of Scotland. March and April offer a mixture of rain, hail and sunshine, and are inspirationally known as the rainbow season. Late April through June offers the best weather with sunshine and light showers. The late summer is often quite mixed, with August and September seeing both sunny days and heavy rain. The winters tend to be wet, with some high winds and sometimes fog, although it rarely freezes. As you can imagine, access to the island can be significantly affected by the weather. The ferry takes visitors to the north of the island where they are met and welcomed by one of the volunteers. In 1847, James Oswald, a relative of a yachting partner of Captain Hamilton, received permission to build a pier at the north end of the island, which he constructed out of beach-gathered stone. Unfortunately, the wood that made up most of the pier was soon eaten by shipworm, and in 1856 a schooner was blown ashore in a gale which destroyed the pier. Despite the efforts of the subsequent owners, by the late 1990s, the original jetty at the North End had fallen into disrepair and only a few rocks remained for the boats landing on the island. This led through two thick, three metre high stone walls used as a cattle chute. The jetty was completely overhauled by volunteers in 1996. Concrete slabs and side walls provided much needed access for volunteers and building supplies, although the algae made it rather slippery. It was later extended to offer greater access at low tide, but the length was limited by a sharp drop in the ocean floor. The cattle chute provided shelter for those waiting for boats, and was a valued part of the Holy Island landscape. The pier was still unsuitable for adverse weather and marine conditions, and this directly affected access to the island for visitors and course participants. Rinpochet wished to build a pontoon to provide safer access and an improved welcome to those coming ashore. In 2011, a series of marine engineering and landing studies were commissioned, which concluded that a pontoon was the most appropriate solution. As a joint project between Holy Isle and Ayrshire Council, including a visit from the local MP, a fundraising effort brought donations in excess of £300,000 to install a custom-made 74-metre floating pontoon as a modern alternative to the ageing jetty. Components, materials, rocks and an excavator were ferried over to help construct the pontoon whereas concrete for the foundations was mixed on Aran and flown across by helicopter. The old jetty was covered with hundreds of tonnes of rocks to improve the aesthetics and act as a breakwater. The project was completed in April 2013 and took about a week. Rinpoche led a dedication ceremony which was attended by volunteers and visitors. In April 2016, the cattle chute was converted into a wooden platform for yoga and meditation. The idea and drawings came from guests attending a course on the island, 
and 12 volunteers completed the work within one week, despite the howling wind and rain. The platform was opened by Lama Yeshe Rinpoche. Lighthouses There are two lighthouses on Holy Isle. The inner lighthouse is located on the southwest coast facing Arran at the south entrance of Lamlash Bay. It was built in 1877 by the well-known lighthouse engineers David and Thomas Stevenson. Its tower height is 17 metres. It had a green light and required four keepers. It is known locally as Wee Donald. The outer lighthouse is located at Pillar Rock Point, the southeastern point of the island. It is a larger lighthouse and was built in 1905 by David and Charles Stevenson. Its tower height is 23 metres and it had a foghorn. The revolving light was lit by paraffin and it required three keepers. It has several rooms inside for the men who worked there and it was the first lighthouse built with a square tower. The Stevensons also designed four cottages with a walled garden for crops which were built adjacent to the inner lighthouse to house four families. The lighthouses were manned 24 hours a day, doing shifts of four hours on, eight hours off, with weekly contact with Aaron for supplies and post. Later, cottages for the families of the lighthouse keepers were built on Aaron, and the men did shifts of one month on and one month off. In 1977, the lighthouses became automated, so the cottages were no longer occupied. The lighthouses have been serviced by local people living on Arran since then. In July 2008, Princess Anne visited Holy Island in her capacity as director of the Northern Lighthouse Company. From an aircraft carrier moored off the south end, a helicopter brought her onto the island she was photographed with Drupon Rinpoche and Lama Katin during her visit and was offered a bag of gooseberries from the garden. The South End Renovations Having completed the purchase of the island, the initial focus was to create a base from which volunteers could tackle future building projects. All the buildings were in a semi-derelict state having suffered damage from the wind, rain, dry rot and vandalism. Rinpoche decided to start work at the south because there was more potential. There were more rooms and the cottages were in slightly better condition than the old farmhouse at the north, despite being abandoned for over 15 years. Rinpoche describes the cottages as like a junkyard. He was told that it would be cheaper to demolish and rebuild the cottages rather than spend an estimated 2.5 million on renovations. Being mindful of the history, out of respect to the Aran residents, and to avoid complex planning applications, Rinpoche decided to renovate the cottages, whilst not changing the external appearance in any way. Kentin Tai Situpa visited Holy Island by helicopter in December 1993. He said, this is a big project and should not be rushed. It must be completed in the right way. To work with this intensely spiritual place will require the purest motivation and very much hard work. A few dedicated resident volunteers were joined by volunteering guests and started the renovation work in early 1993. One volunteer recalls goats and horses coming into the cottages where they were staying. Fortunately, the South End already had electricity thanks to underwater cables. The cottages were previously powered by the engine room containing two massive oil tanks. All the smelly machinery was removed before renovation work could begin. This large flat-roofed building subsequently became the Shrine Room, an important place for group practice during retreat. The Shrine Room was blessed by Akon Rinpoche and other Rinpoches and teachers over the years. The two outer cottages, located more southerly, were completely rewired, extensively replumbed, 
central heating installed, rotten timbers replaced, walls replastered, the interior decorated, and the exterior painted to a high standard. Double glazing was installed throughout at cost price by an external contractor. This was used to accommodate visitors, including Lord and Lady Lucas, and is now used to house the caretaker, retreat master and Rinpoche. The two inner cottages had significant dry rot. Almost all the internal timber had to be stripped out and burnt, and the stonework treated to eradicate any trace of the dry rot fungi. They were then completely refitted to the same standard as the outer cottages and amalgamated to provide accommodation for volunteers and the first retreaters. There are currently 12 rooms to house the retreatants, four downstairs, four upstairs and four in a building to the rear. Renovation works were completed in late 1994. The local ferry continues to provide deliveries of groceries and other supplies to the south via the jetty at the lighthouse. At times over the years the ferry could only deliver to the north, requiring people to barrow their luggage, supplies or building materials almost three kilometres to the other end of the island over challenging terrain. The South End Gardens The one-acre walled garden was originally divided into sections so each of the four lighthouse keepers' families could grow their crops in rich imported soil. By 1993, due to the growing number of residents and visiting volunteers, there was a clear need for organic vegetables, soft fruit and herbs. The garden had the potential to provide this, but it had remained untouched for almost 15 years, so required significant cultivation. Sustainable biodynamic and permaculture techniques have been core principles of the organic garden since the late 1990s. In essence, these involve consideration of the wider ecosystem and adding vitality to the soil and plants rather than depleting it. Whenever Akon Rinpoche came to the South End, he would visit the garden and give advice on geomancy. The gardeners had free access to hundreds of barrow loads of seaweed and horse dung on the island. They collected rainwater for watering and made their own compost by feeding kitchen waste to their wormery, then mixing it with bracken, dung and grass cuttings. Despite the five-foot stone wall, strong winds damaged crops, so small hedges were planted along with 2,000 native trees from seeds or cuttings in the tree nursery they established. This encouraged wildlife to help to screen off the private retreat area. The tree nursery is also helping to repopulate Arran with rare indigenous species, including the Arran white beam. Greenhouses were installed along with a polytunnel, which had to be securely attached to the ground in view of the high winds. There was a spirit of cooperation between the cooks and gardeners from the outset. The garden now produces vegetables including broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus and pumpkins, herbs such as parsley and coriander, and salads such as lettuce and rocket. They also grow a range of cut flowers. The gardens are well on their way to producing enough fresh food for up to 25 people based at the private retreat at the south. The South End Retreats A Buddhist retreat is a period of reflection where practitioners can focus on their practice, free from the distractions and responsibilities of everyday life. The traditional three-year retreat introduces experienced practitioners to more profound spiritual practices within Tibetan Buddhism. From November 1995, a series of short retreats took place in the newly renovated inner cottage, typically with a maximum of seven people, a number of whom went on to do long retreat. From 1998, Lama Rinchen arrived on Holy Isle and looked after these groups. 
In June 2000, Sanjay Tenzin Rinpoche travelled to Holy Isle and performed an elaborate Drupchen ceremony, something his monastery had been performing annually for over a century. The Drupchen subdues the difficulties and negativities of our age. The ceremony lasted about a week and involved shifts of continuous mantra recitations and lama dancing. The first traditional retreat was opened by Akon Rinpoche in October 2002 and finished in March 2006. Twelve women participated under the direction of the retreat master Lama Zangmo. There were three caretakers, two of whom were also the gardeners. The second traditional retreat started in October 2010 and finished in June 2014. Again, 12 women participated, but this time the retreat master was Drupon Rinpoche, assisted by Katan Lama. There were two caretakers in addition to the gardeners. The third long retreat started in 2016. Eight women attended the preliminary part of the retreat, and three chose to continue with the retreat. As before, the retreat master is Drupon Rinpoche, assisted by Katan Lama. Rinpoche's live teachings are streamed from Nepal and the retreat does not have a fixed end date. These long retreats became known as Inner Light Retreats after the Inner Lighthouse and the spiritual connotation. The men's retreats took place in parallel at Rockpur's Glen Skorodel property on Arran. It is Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's prayer that during his lifetime there will be many realised beings on Holy Island, Dharma practitioners who have dedicated their lives to achieving realisation, or Buddhahood, for the benefit of all sentient beings. Then, he says, Buddhism will truly become part of Western civilization and culture. Wisdom Palace As retreat master, Rinpoche required accommodation both for his own retreats and as a base when visiting and supporting the retreatants. This was to be the first new structure built on Holy Island and the first planning application. The location and orientation were decided by Situ Rinpoche, an expert in geomancy, and Kenshin Trangu Rinpoche. The property was designed by Situ Rinpoche and Lama Yeshe Rinpoche. Thanks to a generous donation, the reinforced foundations were laid by February 1995 and building was completed in the summer that year. The company Rinpoche commissioned to build the property went into liquidation, so he had to go to auction and buy the house again. There were a number of practical challenges due to its location halfway up the exposed flank of a mountain. The planners required the building to withstand 200 miles per hour winds, so every part of the property, including the roof, was bolted down without the use of nails. The cabin has a thick outer shell and a thin, well-insulated inner shell separated by a cavity. There are specialist windows in the south-facing porch to maximise heat and underfloor slate to heat the interior. In keeping with the ecological approach to this building project, a helicopter brought most of the building over from Aran to avoid leaving tracks on the hillside or the need to build a large path. Nevertheless, a team of strong volunteers still had to carry bags of cement, logs, roof tiles, windows, doors, insulation, floorboards, a bathroom suite and white goods from the jetty at the south end halfway up the mountain and then build the house. Furthermore, many stones, including a large naga stone, were carried up from the beach for the garden and for a stone wall to offer added protection from the wind. The building is like a stupa. It is pyramid-shaped with glass skylights and a crystal at its peak filled with special relics. The location is the heart of Holy Isle, having been chosen and blessed by great lineage masters. It is believed to channel energy from the neighbouring island of Elsa Craig and is intricately linked with natural phenomena such as rising spring water. A famous Zen priest commented 
that the channel of energy coming through the house meant that a powerful and realised practitioner staying in the property would pacify obstacles to the island's development for the benefit of many beings. Situ Rinpoche stayed there with Lama Rinpoche for several days. Rather than it being the retreat master's house, Rinpoche dedicated the property to the great lineage masters and named it Wisdom Palace Lineage House. Interestingly, at a time when most islands are sinking and decreasing in size, Holy Isle continues to grow. Retreat Pods Rinpoche's intention from the outset was for Holy Isle to be a place of retreat. In Tibet, traditional meditation retreats were undertaken in mountain caves, and this inspired Rinpoche's vision for modern cave-like retreat pods. Given the more isolated and hard-to-reach location of the south end of the island, Rinpoche felt this would be the best location for the pods, and he intended to build 108 due to the auspiciousness of this number in both Buddhism and the Tibetan culture. Out of respect to the residents of Aran, Rinpoche decided to open up the design of both the long-term retreat centre at the south and the interfaith centre at the north to skilled architects. This international competition was launched by His Holiness the Dalai Lama at Samyaling in May 1993 and was the largest architectural competition in Europe at the time. A panel of judges was formed, including Akon Rinpoche, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche and three respected architectural and cultural specialists. The panel created a brief for the architects, which included guidance from specialist technical advisory panels on relevant sociological, environmental and ecological issues. Hundreds of architectural students and their lecturers made the journey to Aaron and Holy Isle. When the competition closed six months later in November 1993, 198 completed entries had been submitted. The panel met at Samyaling Ling in December 1993 and announced the winners. Rinpoche preferred a different design to the winning entry, so that was used instead. Billy Connolly, who had expressed an interest in purchasing Holy Island in the early 1990s, graciously made the official announcement of the prize winners at St Mungo's Museum of Religion in Glasgow. Before applying for planning permission, a detailed environmental impact study was required to consider the effect on plant and animal life. There were numerous considerations including the provision of fresh water, drainage facilities and waste disposal, minimising the impact on the continuing use of the lighthouse and relocating the emergency helicopter landing area, all whilst matching the existing architectural style of the island. The resulting proposal was fine-tuned by Situ Rinpoche according to the ancient science of geomancy. A three-fold planning application was submitted for the pods, extensions to the lighthouse cottages and to extend the farmhouse at the north to form a centre for world peace and health. The planners consulted numerous local and national government departments and heritage organisations and on the 9th of October 1995, the planning application was approved. Despite having permission to build the 108 pods, Rinpoche decided that it would be overcrowded and not beneficial for the island, so he reduced the number to just two, located on the hillside below Wisdom Palace. The wood for the pods was prepared and each piece carefully numbered in the Samyiling workshops. They were loaded onto 25 heavy pallets just fitting on a 14-metre flatbed truck, which delivered them to Lamlash Bay. They were then loaded onto pontoons and towed across to the jetty at the south end, where teams of volunteers unloaded them. Apart from losing one pallet overnight in a mighty storm and suffering seagull attacks, which forced work to be suspended for two days, the operation went smoothly. Thanks to a combination of hard physical labour and a motorised wheelbarrow whose engine was quickly worn out. Each pod weighs about 20 tonnes and was dug into the hillside like a cave. There was almost no topsoil and many stones to dig out. The design of the pods was highly experimental. They sit in a watertight rubberized bag 
and have a two-wall construction, which allows air to flow right around the building. They have triple glazing, underfloor heating, 30 centimeters of eco-friendly insulation throughout, and heat recovery ventilation. The roofs were covered with grass to blend in with the natural environment and had the added benefit of good soundproofing. The curved, load-bearing beams required complex calculations to support the heavy, wet grass. Building started in the summer of 2009 and took approximately one year to complete. During construction, one of the builders lived in a three-square-metre hut on the hill for five months until it was blown away by a storm. He recalls lightning storms which left burns on the ground, resembling a UFO landing site. Students of Lama Yeshe Rinpoche have bought the pods on long-term leases and, with his permission, some are given the opportunity to do short personal retreats. Rock paintings As we leave the south end and start to walk clockwise towards the north, as is customary in Tibetan culture, we see images of some of the great lineage holders carved into the rocks, namely Marpa, Milarepa, Gampopa, and the first Karmapa Dusum Kyempa. These great beings have special significance for all Tibetan Buddhists, particularly those of the Karma Kagyul school. There are also carvings of deities such as Green Tara, White Tara, and the Buddha himself. Lama Yeshe decided which lamas or deities should be carved and chose the rocks. Most were granite, but some were a more porous sandstone. All of the images, except for the large Buddha, were drawn by master artist Sherub Palden Beru on paper. Then transferred to the rocks by one of his students. Sherub Palden Beru's nephew, Venerable Jamso Tashi, then carved the images into the rocks using a special hammer and chisel in a similar method to that used in Tibet. This work required him to travel to Holy Island for approximately five one-month-long visits over a four-year period. The next stage was to paint the rock carvings. A temporary hut was constructed for the artists and a plastic tent was pitched over the rocks to offer some protection from the weather. A masonry paint undercoat was used, acrylic coloured paints and multiple layers of outdoor acrylic varnish to resist the weather. Over time cracks appeared in the paint alongside flaking and fading colours. This required washing, stripping and scraping for many days before they were repainted, mostly in 2007. The large Buddha carving was especially challenging because it was on an elevated rock face requiring makeshift scaffolding. Rinpoche intended to make a very large Guru Rinpoche carving on the red cliffs at the southeast part of the island, but sadly Jamso's eyesight deteriorated so it wasn't possible. The carvings were blessed by Trangu Rinpoche, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche and Sherub Palden Beru. The eyes of the lineage masters and the Buddha were painted or opened by Situ Rinpoche. The Healing Well and Judgment Rock Before reaching St Malasha's cave, we come across two neighbouring landmarks. The first is a fresh spring known as the Healing Well. Pure fresh water bubbles up from below the mountain in a seemingly endless stream. We strongly believe that this water is pure and blessed with healing properties. An 18th century traveller recorded that the natives used to drink and bathe in the well for all lingering ailments. Pilgrims continued to visit the well into the 20th century seeking a cure for ills and to bring a blessing. And the island's retreaters have used the spring's water into the 21st century. The next landmark is a huge block of stone with a level top known as the Judgment Stone or St Malash's Table. The four top corners have been cut out in what could be seats and it has been suggested 
that the stone was used to preach from or to proclaim justice, St Malasha's judgment for those who sought him out to settle grievances. The judgment stone also has an unusual cross carved into it, one of only three of its kind found in Britain. St Malasha's Cave The cave where St Malasha lived for a decade in the late 6th century is about halfway along the western shore of Holy Island and about 10 metres above high water mark. It consists of an overhanging sandstone rock with a sunken stone floor and it's thought that much of the opening of the cave was closed up by a wall to keep the weather out. A Celtic cross adorns the sandstone above the cave entrance and simple crosses are carved into the walls, perhaps made by pilgrims. St Malasha had an ample supply of fresh water, but the island was rather scant of other resources for growing food. Given its historical significance, Rinpoche left the cave in its original state. Layers of animal dung were removed, but he did not dig down enough to fully expose the original floor slabs, so the original cave floor was significantly deeper. Stones were laid into the hillside as steps for easier visitor access and slabs were put down to protect the original floor. There is also a visitor's bench nearby. Rinpoche received a very small icon of St Malasha and he felt honoured to be able to fix a copy of it to a rock at the cave's entrance. The cave continues to be used for spiritual practice. Kempo Sultram Jamso was also known to teach from the cave in 2003 and 2004 and both Situ Rinpoche and Sanjay Tensin Rinpoche gave impromptu teachings there. Several short meditation retreats have taken place in the cave, including Lama Yeshe Rinpoche himself. Situ Rinpoche said that Holy Island was as blessed as any place that had been blessed in Tibet by Guru Rinpoche. Stupa Point As we continue to walk along the path towards the north, we reach White Point, a protruding cliff sitting six metres above the shoreline. Holy Isle, Lamlash and Lamlash Bay played a significant role in both world wars, Lamlash being a busy naval base and a popular anchorage for the Navy between the wars. Throughout World War II, the base was protected by booms supporting huge anti-submarine nets at both ends of the bay. Next to the boathouse, there is a huge iron ring set into the ground that was a tethering point for one of those nets. At White Point, there are the remains of a defensive brick-built gun position. In stark contrast to its wartime use, Rinpoche intends to build a massive crystal stupa at White Point, so he renamed it Stupa Point. The Boathouse As we continue north, we pass the elusive Smuggler's Cave, which was used for smuggling whiskey in the mid-19th century. If you're fortunate enough to find the concealed entrance, you'll need a good light source and to crawl in on all fours. The next landmark we reach is the Boathouse. In the late 18th century, Captain James Hamilton used the island as a yachting base, and it's conceivable that he used the Boathouse for his hobby. By the late 1990s, the boathouse was completely shambolic, having been used to store bits of metal and rubbish over many years, probably to avoid the cost of removing them from the island. The remaining sections of roof were blown off in a storm in late 1998. Rinpoche wanted to convert the boathouse into a heritage centre and tea room to increase the attraction of the island to day visitors and to provide more open access to local residents and the general public. Unfortunately, the planners decided that such a significant increase in the public use of Holy Isle would require at least an additional 30 car parking spaces at Lamlash, something that Rinpoche was unable to provide. With Rinpoche's determination to serve the public, the boathouse was renovated during the long, hot summer of 2000, and a new roof was added two years later. 
It is now used as an information centre and to offer a complimentary cup of tea or coffee and shelter to those who are waiting for the ferry. There is also a selection of books, mugs and other small items for sale and an adjacent toilet block. On the first floor of the boathouse there is a private shrine room which is sometimes used by residents for group prayer and meditation. The Centre for World Peace and Health, Building and Renovation. Now that the South End had been sufficiently renovated and developed, the volunteers could turn their attention to the North End of the island. As stated, the old farmhouse was built in 1779 by Captain James Hamilton and so it was already over 200 years old when purchased by Rockler Trust. It had been uninhabited for over four years before the purchase of the island in 1992, and water had entered the building through the storm-damaged roof and broken windows, giving rise to wet and dry rot. Most of the rooms were uninhabitable, and there were rats in the loft. As with the development work at the South End, Ripochet was advised to demolish the existing building and start afresh. Ever mindful of the local residents and, despite the additional cost, Rinpoche chose to restore the farmhouse and mainly extend behind it so the view from Aaron would be similar. As mentioned, the International Architectural Competition, detailed environmental impact study and threefold planning application involving numerous government departments and heritage organisations included development of both south and north of the island in this case transforming the farmhouse into the Centre for World Peace and Health. The final design was entirely Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's conception, once again with geomancy guidance from Situ Rinpoche. This aerial photo shows the entrance, which was relocated to the north rather than the front, and seven rows of gorse and willow as a windbreak. Renovation work started in 1997, and was greatly facilitated by the electricity supply which the Morris family had connected from the south in the mid-1980s. The majority of the renovations were undertaken by volunteers, including visiting volunteers who attended summer working holidays. The old scullery was converted into a kitchen and a tool shed was used as a temporary dining area. The remaining outbuildings were used to accommodate the volunteers. Most of the building materials came from off the island. For example, building sand would be delivered loose to Lamlash Jetty, then volunteers would bag it up and transport it over on the local ferry. One notable exception was small pebbles from the beach, which were carefully sifted for size and washed to make hardcore. Externally, a professional roofer replaced the damaged slates. The wall heads were rebuilt and the guttering, lead work and roof vents were replaced. The farmhouse was then painted white with damson-coloured stonework. Internally, the farmhouse was cleared and all the old plaster, rotten timber, wiring and plumbing were removed. The chimneys were cleaned and bricked up with wall vents fitted throughout. The original floor was broken up and relayed with damp proofing and insulation covered by stripped pine or quarry tiles. The wooden lintels above the windows were replaced with concrete and double glazing was installed. By the summer of 2000, the farmhouse renovations were complete, offering five bedrooms, a living room with wood-burning stove, a shrine room, and two shower rooms with toilet. The first invited guests, sponsors, and Lama Yeshe himself stayed in the farmhouse for the first time. The second phase of the development at the north was the construction of two wings off the main farmhouse, to provide additional guest accommodation and a large dining area. They formed a courtyard which offered protection from the wind. This was combined with the construction of the Peace Hall to host courses, workshops and conferences. 
This enclosed the fourth side of the courtyard and together these formed the Centre for World Peace and Health. The Peace Hall is a non-denominational sacred space open to people of all faiths to promote spiritual tolerance through shared activity and retreat. Many people felt that Rinpoche's plans were too ambitious, but nevertheless he disregarded the winning architect's designs and created his own design, which was subsequently built. In Lama Yeshe's words, the Peace Hall is big enough to seat a hundred people, but is also designed to function beautifully as a spacious room for a vast diversity of workshops. It has inspiring acoustics and underfloor and overhead heating. Natural light streams in from two sides and from the high pyramidal ceiling. The walls are panelled with beautiful pure cedar wood, which has a nice scent and discourages midges. Ecologically sound materials and methods were used whenever possible in the renovation and construction including a reed bed for purifying wastewater. The water passes through a settling tank, then through the reeds which sit in a base of gravel covered by a membrane on a slight incline. Clean water trickles out of the bed and solid material is removed annually to nourish an adjacent static bed. These significant building projects required external contractors with heavy machinery delivered on transport barges and a satellite phone for communications. The Morris family had left some toy trucks on the beach and Akon Rinpoche had told the residents to leave them there. Almost a decade later, when the large excavator and other machines were delivered on a barge, it reminded the residents of how the miniature toys had looked when they first arrived on the island. One large boulder, known as the Elephant Stone, was uncovered on the beach, and Rinpoche asked for it to be placed in the centre of the courtyard. The excavator driver found this to be rather challenging, and it almost broke the machine. Many residents commented on how courteous and generous the building crew were, and how well they worked together. Construction of the two wings and Peace Hall was started in 2002, and completed in 2003. The Centre for World Peace and Health was officially opened by Lama Yeshe Rinpoche on the 31st of May, when over 300 people came to see what the local newspaper described as the Holy Island Hilton. The Centre for World Peace and Health courses and short retreats. Lama Yeshe Rinpoche values open dialogue with all who visit. The Peace Hall has hosted many courses, workshops and conferences each year, generally between April and October. The first courses were held in the summer of 2003 for Tai Chi and meditation, and these course leaders are still running retreats on Holy Isle almost 20 years later. The Peace Hall, where the courses and retreats take place, is neutral, providing open ground for every faith. There are no specific religious representations there, so if they wish, any group that comes can bring their own symbol for use during their visit, such as a statue or cross. Courses held in the Peace Hall have included Buddhist teachings, meditation and mindfulness retreats, Christian and interfaith retreats, Qigong, Japanese sword, craniosacral therapy, voice workshops, lucid dreaming retreats, dance and massage. 
One of the most popular courses is Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's annual September retreat. This focuses on meditation and exploring the island in a relaxed and informal way. Returning guests and annual courses create an atmosphere of family reunion and positive energy for the island. Following requests for a space to do quiet retreats over winter, the centre kept its doors open to individuals in the winter for the first time in 2005. Many of the retreatants return each year and stay between three months and three weeks, with support from an experienced practitioner as required. One particularly notable event was the 10-day Drubchen ceremony, which took place in the summer of 2006, led by Dulma Churji Rinpoche. A group of 20 monks from Tibet and India, together with monks and nuns from Samyaling, participated in this powerful practice to remove obstacles to world peace. In a similar way to the Drubchen ceremony led by Sanjay Tenzin Rinpoche in the south six years earlier, it was a busy time requiring many days of preparation and 24-hour mantra recitation. The Centre for World Peace and Health Interfaith Activities Lama Yeshe Rinpoche is the Buddhist representative among the religious leaders of Scotland, hosted by the Scottish Interfaith Council. They meet twice a year at various venues across Scotland to discuss wide-ranging topics and encourage their respective communities to support interfaith dialogue. Rinpoche was aware that Holy Island was a holy place for Christians, so he was keen for people of all faiths and none to feel welcome on the island. It therefore became known as an interfaith centre. In 1992, there was a large interfaith meeting attended by Trangu Rinpoche, Akon Rinpoche and Lama Yeshe Rinpoche to celebrate taking custodianship of the island. Following a tree planting ceremony, the delegation were walking to St Malash's cave when a robin landed on Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's foot. Rinpoche recalls, I was so overwhelmingly glad when it happened I thought it was someone introducing me to Holy Island, and it gave me an absolute confidence that I would be able to achieve everything I wanted to achieve there. A ceremony took place in St Malash's Cave as a dedication of the interfaith activities on the island. His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama intended to visit Holy Island in May 1993, but unfortunately the helicopter was grounded by bad weather. Nevertheless, many other Tibetan teachers have visited and blessed the island over the last 30 years, including Ringu Tulku, Tsokni Rinpoche, Yonge Minja Rinpoche, Maratika Rinpoche, and Chime Rinpoche. In August 1995, the first interfaith work camp took place, sponsored by the Bridge Educational Trust. This included visitors from the Findhorn Foundation. Four peace poles were donated, inscribed with the words May peace prevail on earth in different languages on each of the four faces to raise international awareness for world peace. Each pole is planted at one of the four corners of the island to radiate positive energy in the four directions. These were planted in the summers of 1997 and 1998, the latter by a multi-faith peace gathering to mark the beginning of the multi-faith sacred space volunteer work holiday. The summer of 2000 saw the next interfaith gathering. Sister Isabel Smith led a nine-day interfaith retreat in the new guest house. Lama Yeshe Rinpoche joined them for a walk to the cave, talk about St Malasha and a group meditation. In August 2003, there was a large interfaith gathering at the newly opened Centre for World Peace and Health, organised by the Scottish Interfaith Council. This was the first meeting of religious leaders on Holy Island and was attended by 21 participants, including the leaders of all the major faiths in Scotland and members of the Scottish Interfaith Council. The delegates visited St Malash's Cave and, like all visitors, the leaders were happy to accept Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's five golden rules – while they were on the island. Interfaith dialogue has therefore happened very easily and naturally. In 2004 and 2005, there were long weekends of Christian-Buddhist dialogue 
between Sister Isabel, Secretary to the Scottish Interfaith Council, and Golongma Lamo. And in August 2009, a Buddhist Christian contemplatives retreat attended by clergy, which the attendees found to be very moving and uplifting. The Centre for World Peace and Health, Gardens. Beautiful gardens surround the Centre for World Peace and Health, providing year-round organic vegetables, fruit, herbs and flowers for use in the Centre's kitchen and public spaces. The gardens are at the heart of Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's vision of environmental sustainability and his belief that our own health and well-being is not separate from the health and well-being of the natural world. The late 1990s saw the development of the Monk's Orchard, a stone dike to the south of the farmhouse, which had previously been used as a camping area for volunteers. Inspired and designed by a resident permaculture expert, dedicated volunteers worked to create a beautiful garden of vegetables and flower beds alongside an orchard of donated fruit trees. By late 2007, the monk's orchard needed to focus solely on vegetable production to increase self-sufficiency. So the vibrant mandala garden was created around the Peace Hall. This intricate flower garden provides a rich experience and a refreshing setting for outdoor meditation for the centre's guests. Visitors will see small rock paintings depicting important figures in Tibetan Buddhism and Himalayan woodland flowers, including medicinal species which were directly overseen by Akong Rinpoche, which are protected from the wind by the fairy garden in front. The gardeners use only manual tools and work joyfully and effortlessly under Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's guidance. In late 2009, another vegetable garden, known as the Wish Fulfilling Garden, was created to the north of the centre, more than doubling the growing area. This garden contains three polytunnels, which allows most of the island's crops to be grown from seeds, sourced from small cooperative and ethical organic seed companies, and facilitates the year-round growth of salad crops. Despite the high winds, the outer skin has only been replaced once to date, in 2018. The gardeners overcame numerous challenges besides Scotland's short growing season. Stone dike walls and layers of trees and bushes were used to provide a natural windbreak, and large quantities of manure, seaweed and bracken were needed to help create deep beds of rich soil on what was essentially a barren beach. These are now full of life and supplemented only with natural biodynamic preparations and homemade compost, much of which comes from kitchen waste. Two honeybee hives help to pollinate the crops and the abundant frogs and thrushes help to keep the slugs under control. Maintaining the vegetable gardens requires between two and four full-time volunteer gardeners, supported by many part-time helpers, depending on the season. In general, winter is the time for making composts and spreading mulches, spring for sowing and planting, and summer and autumn for harvesting, preparing and preserving crops. The garden produces large quantities of green vegetables, salads, culinary herbs and herbal teas for an all-year round supply to the centre. Seasonally, they grow alliums such as leeks, onions and garlic, brassicas such as kale, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, radish, turnip and sweet, salads such as lettuce, rocket and spinach, peas and beans, chard and beetroot, courgette and squash, tomatoes, asparagus, cucumbers, corn and chilies, as well as a selection of fruit including apples, pears, plums, rhubarb and a range of berries. The gardeners harvest from the garden twice a day, 365 days a year, to cater for 8 to 80 people a week and the kitchen staff are involved in planning what the gardeners will grow for the following year. The gardens offer the Holy Island community and guests an opportunity to live and work sustainably to help reduce the causes of climate change and to help conserve the natural world. They clearly highlight the value of organic methods in creating and maintaining biodiversity and a natural ecological balance, which in turn supports the healthy growth of plants 
and the health and well-being of those who enjoy them. Volunteers All of Holy Isle's development has been undertaken by volunteers, except for a few specialised projects as already described. This has made it possible to actualise Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's vision for Holy Isle. To maintain Rinpoche's vision, there is a clear need for volunteers to run and maintain the centre, organise courses, manage the gardens, cook, clean and care for the island's environment. Many volunteers have offered their time to Holy Isle over the last 30 years, from skilled electricians to beachcombers. Currently, there's a team of around 16 full-time volunteers, both resident and visiting, supported by a pool of volunteers who offer to help at busy times. Volunteers are offered food and accommodation, but they are not paid. They adopt a flexible approach, although typically they will focus on one aspect within the centre during the season. They commit to a manageable number of hours each week and have regular rest days. Rinpoche encourages the volunteers to learn to unconditionally serve and give with tolerance and acceptance. From a spiritual perspective, it is believed that both the individual and those they are serving will find fulfilment in this approach, and Lama Yeshe Rinpoche envisages the work on Holy Island to continue in this way. Stupas A stupa, or Choten in Tibetan, is a 2,500-year-old tradition introduced and taught by the Buddha to help transform and purify imbalance in the environment. The measurements of the outer form have to be extremely precise and the inner contents properly placed and consecrated. There are eight different kinds of stupa in Tibetan Buddhism, each referring to a major event in the Buddha's life. In keeping with the local style and culture, there were no intentions of building stupas or hanging prayer flags, items which are popular within the Tibetan culture. Over time, more people expressed an interest in these, so plans were drawn up to build stupas within the front wall of the centre. The design was later changed, and the stupas were moulded and built in 2002 at their present location, just in front of the pontoon where visitors are greeted. In 2017, following 15 years of rain and wind, the stupas required some repairs and were repainted, typically with a primer, followed by red, then gold. Prayer flags are used to promote peace, compassion, strength and wisdom. Tibetans believe the prayers and mantras will be blown by the wind to spread the goodwill and compassion into all pervading space. Every May, the flags are replaced on an auspicious day in the Tibetan calendar, usually by Lama Yeshe Rinpoche himself. Environmental Stewardship A plan for nature conservation on the island was drawn up by experts from the Nature Conservancy Council in collaboration with the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Although Scotland would historically have been covered in trees, Holy Island probably wasn't due to its exposure to rough weather. Nevertheless, the importance of planting trees and taking care of existing ones is acknowledged to be a cornerstone of environmental protection due to their close association with weather patterns and nature's delicate ecological balance. Furthermore, trees support biodiversity and provide shelter for wildlife. Since 1993, over 45,000 trees have been planted on the island by volunteers, guided by a professional forester, in several locations to the north, northwest and south end of the island. 
The 25 different species are all native to Scotland and most were grown from local seeds, including rare trees which are indigenous to Holy Isle and Arran. From the beginning of the Holy Island project there has been an opportunity to sponsor trees on the island. Many of these are dedicated to loved ones, including Akon Ribbushay, and the children of Dunblane. Fences and walls were constructed to protect these young trees. The original stone wall in front of the farmhouse was taken down by the building contractors so they could access the farmhouse and build the extensions and peace hall. They subsequently rebuilt the wall and Rinpoche intended for this to be extended a long way around the island in the form of a dry stone wall. The dry stone dikes to the south of the farmhouse were restored and a long dry stone wall was constructed to the north of the farmhouse, stretching approximately 250 metres thanks to the island's long-standing monk ranger. A long drain was dug to control and catch the water running down the hills. However, the water had changed course within a year, so another was dug. The constant flow of water across the paths from elevated positions on the island down to the shore created marshy areas on some of the paths. Path improvement plans were drawn up by a local friend of Holy Isle, and volunteers undertook significant path upgrades, including the installation of culverts and land drains. Rhododendrons were introduced to Arran and Holy Isle in Victorian times. Despite their pleasing aesthetics, they are an invasive species which colonise the landscape, thus leaving less opportunity for native species to flourish and less space for pasture land for animal grazing. Controlling these plants and also the bracken is one of the island's ongoing ecological objectives. Holy Island is embracing the challenge of caring for and stewardship of the island. It is addressing the spiritual value of land through restoring and conserving the natural ecology, hand in hand with the creation of the Centre for World Peace and Health, founded on ecological principles. Wildlife For centuries, the island was used for the commercial grazing of sheep with the last 200 black-faced sheep taken off the island in 1970. The white San and goats, with impressive horns and smiling faces, were rumoured to have been brought to the island by the Vikings as livestock, although it's more likely the Victorian gamekeepers introduced them. They tend to be quite solitary and will eat most things, including seaweed. The lighthouse keepers sometimes kept goats to give milk to their children. In 1971, the University's Federation for Animal Welfare owned the island and introduced five highland cattle, including one very large bull. They were lifted into a Clyde puffer in cargo nets at Lamlash and dropped near Holy Island to swim ashore. They lived on the island with their offspring until 1990. The UFAW also introduced five Eriske ponies, descendants of the Kelto-Nordic native ponies from the Hebridean Isle of Eriske. The ponies are a hardy breed with a dense waterproof coat, enabling them to live comfortably in the Scottish climate all year round. They are often born black or bay and turn grey and later white as they grow older. The ponies spend their time on the plateaus of the hills or on the fields at the south end but they regularly graze the fields surrounding the centre at the north. It's a unique arrangement, living a free and wild life without human interference, yet comfortable near humans. They have naturally settled into three groups and live in peaceful coexistence with one another. The Animal Welfare Organisation, the SPCA, has reported that the herds look very healthy. The UFAW introduced 25 soy sheep, this ancient breed have been present on the outer Hebridean island of Soy, Norse for sheep, since the Bronze Age. They are smaller and more elegant than domesticated sheep, dark brown in colour with a whitish belly. They travel in groups and their coats gradually drop off over time. 
In terms of marine life, there are many colourful and interesting jellyfish in the Bay of Lamlash. Common and grey seals are often seen near Holy Island Jetty or basking on red rock. And there have been occasional sightings of porpoises, bottlenose dolphins, basking sharks and minke whales. Lamlash Bay has a no-take zone towards the north. This was the first community-led marine reserve of its kind in Scotland when established in 2008. No fish or shellfish can be taken from its water or seabed, including the shore area. The nearby island of Elsa Craig is a nature reserve and the second largest gannet breeding colony in the world. In the late summer, these birds plummet from a great height into the water to catch their fish without fear of being penalised for fishing in the no-take zone. There are over 20 species of birds breeding on the island and closer to 60 species have been sighted on the island. These species each find their preferred environment whether it is in the bracken, heather, on the stony shore, wading in the shallows, on the rocky slopes, in ungrazed grass, in woodland and hedgerows, in larger trees or in the sandstone cliffs. Birds of prey are commonly sighted. In Lama Rinpoche's words, the wild indigenous animals are all given a home and not asked to do anything except enjoy their lives. Red Rock and the East of the Island As we continue towards the northern tip of the island we reach Red Rock, a large red sandstone outcrop with small rock pools and views towards the north of Arran. Soon after Red Rock, the path ends and gives way to rocks, boulders and overgrown vegetation, which marks the start of the nature reserve on the east of the island. Visitors are politely requested not to walk there for their own safety, and so the animals remain undisturbed. The east coast of the island is more exposed to the wind and weather. There are several features including a small pebble beach, the two burns, two gullies of water running off the plateau. And towards the southeast, just before Pillar Rock Lighthouse, you reach Dorothy's Well, a large fall of water running off the plateau down the red sandstone cliffs. Near the southerly tip of the island, just before we rejoin the south end buildings and inner lighthouse, is Lama Yeshe's seat, a natural meditation box carved into the sandstone by the action of ancient seas. This is one of the many powerful places on Holy Island which Rinpoche has used since the Holy Island project began, as ever supported by his Sangha and volunteers. The Summit Now that we've completed a full lap of the island, all that remains is a trek over the island's summit. The summit is accessed through a gap in the stone wall just to the north of the farmhouse. It leads up a grassy hill to a stile which continues along a winding path through woodland. This gets progressively steeper until reaching the first peak on Mullach Beg at 231 metres. The terrain then levels off before becoming more rocky with a final rough scramble up the windswept summit of Mullach Moor at an altitude of 314 metres. The summit offers wonderful panoramic views of the Ayrshire coast, Arran and the Clyde estuary. To the west there are some plateaus with water sources where groups of ponies are often sighted. The descent is steep and should be approached with care. Sections of the path are roped off for safety due to the cliffs on either side and heather which conceals crevices. At the fork in the path towards the south you can turn left towards Pillar Rock Lighthouse and then follow the shoreline around to the south end or simply turn right at the fork to go directly to the south end. Conclusions and Dedication Reflecting back on the three initial aims of the Holy Island project, it is clear that they've been achieved. Development work has conserved the island's pure environment and serves as an example to others. A long-term retreat has been established at the south 
which provides conditions conducive to inner development, and the Centre for World Peace and Health provides open ground for those of all faiths and none. Holy Isle is honoured and blessed to have been visited by many spiritual people and religious leaders of various faiths over the centuries. Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's motivation for Holy Isle was to bring great benefit and inspiration to people everywhere through the combination of pure minds within a pure environment. Thanks to his inspiring vision and tireless energy, the Holy Isle project has built up a worldwide reputation and united hearts and minds through shared goals and interfaith dialogue. This vision of how the world could be a place of safety, peace and harmony for all sentient beings has been echoed by His Holiness 17th Jalwa Karmapa. A team of dedicated volunteers have made it possible to actualize Lama Yeshe Rinpoche's vision for Holy Island, both in terms of the development and the ongoing running and maintenance of the island, thus making Holy Isle a beautiful and sustainable place to visit and to live. We are most fortunate to have made a connection with this holy place and to all the precious and generous people who have contributed to this unique altruistic project. This slideshow was created as an offering to Lama Yeshe Rinpoche to capture what has been achieved on Holy Isle through his vast vision and wisdom over the last 30 years, and to offer sincere gratitude from past, present and future generations.